Welcome to, are you ready for some chaos? So raise your hand if you're ready for some chaos. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, what, what I'm gonna talk about today, this is just up front, so if it doesn't interest you, you can walk over to another session. We're gonna talk a little about scaling today, both horizontal and vertical. I'm going to talk about distributed databases and how the CAP theorem applies to them. I'm going to talk to you about Couchbase, which is a, a distributed database, uh, NoSQL product. And I'm going to show you this crazy thing I cr created called the Couch Case, um, if it works. If it doesn't work, I have a backup plan, so don't worry. Okay, uh, so uh, just before we get started, uh, just a serious note here, I'll, I'm leaving a slide blank for my mentor and friend Jim Holmes, who's going through some tough stuff this week, and so just want to dedicate this session to him. I wish him the best. So where are we? We're at uh, Code Mash. If you guys don't know that, uh, then what the heck are you doing here? But I'm recording this session, so if you're watching this at home, go to CodeMash.org, check out this conference. It's great. You need to get here. It's in the middle of winter in Sandusky, Ohio, in a water park. This doesn't sound appealing. I don't know what does. Who am I? I am Matthew Groves. I work for Couchbase as a developer advocate, which means I talk to developers, help developers to do awesome stuff, get feedback about our product, uh, speak at uh, conferences like this, that sort of thing. I have a Twitter account. Uh, I'd love if you, uh, I could follow you on Twitter. I have a podcast and blog. I'd love to have you on my podcast if you're interested. And uh, I'm not an expert on anything, really. Uh, but I'm an enthusiast. I'm very excited about technologies. I'm very excited to, to tell you what I know about them, to help get you started, and, uh, and, and get your feedback about, about things. Uh, obligatory slide before we get started. Couchbase is what I'm talking about. It is not CouchDB. They share an acronym. They're both open source. Um, some of the same people have worked on them off and on, but they're not a fork of each other. They're not the same software. Uh, Couchbase is Couchbase Incorporated. CouchDB is Apache Foundation. So I uh, always get that question, so I figured I'd put a slide in the deck just to address that up front. And if you're on Twitter, use hashtag Couchbase. Tweet a picture. I would appreciate it so my boss knows I'm not uh, screwing around. Okay. So who in here works in web development? Okay, most of you, most of you. Uh, who works on sites that are, say, generally accessible to the public? Okay, a lot of you. Uh, what about really, really big uh, in terms of traffic and users? Who works on those kind of websites? One, two, three, okay. I know really, really big is sort of arbitrary and meaningless, but still wanted to ask, know what's going on there. So let's talk about scaling a website. Now, we all know the web is, is stateless, and so you can add more servers to a web farm, and that's how you can increase your capacity for, for web traffic. You add additional web servers, maybe put a load balancer in there, um, but it's not a big deal to scale out the web. You guys have probably done this before. But, and oftentimes, there are multiple web servers, but they're maybe all sharing one database. And the strain on that database is going to increase, and it may become the bottleneck. So you, you may not have just one database, you may have a couple, maybe like one for session information uh, or cache, and one for your, your business information. But it's, it's linear, right? It's, you have one for each of those things. And so if this is the situation you're in, there's some things you can do, like you could profile your, your application, you can uh, implement some caching, uh, optimization, indexing, all those things to squeeze all the performance you can out of uh, that single database. And, and hopefully you should do those things before you think about scaling out even farther. But at some point, you're going to need to do something about this database as your user base grows and grows and there's more and more traffic. So one thing you can do is you can what's called vertically scale your database. And that kind of looks something like this. It just means switching to a beefier server. So you may start with a really cheap one core machine over here on the left, um, upgrade to a four core database um, server. And then uh, as your business grows, maybe you'll go to eight cores. And, and, and so far, you know, this is not terribly difficult to do, but maybe you find yourself doing really, really well and you've 
got a front page of Reddit, uh, and it's, or it's Black Friday, or something's going well for you, you're getting a lot of traffic, and now you start thinking about pricing the bazillion core server over here, the Godzilla database server, uh, 90 cores or, or more. And those, are, those actually exist, and they're, and they're out there. Um, so that is one approach you can do to scaling, just keep going in this direction. But there are some problems with this approach. Uh, for one, it's somewhat impractical. There is at least a theoretical ceiling of the number of cores you can, you can at least purchase, if not put into a single machine. So there may be a limit, like, oh, well, we've bought the most expensive server in the world. Where do we go from here? It also can get very expensive. So 90 core, bazillion core machine can be very, very pricey hardware. Not just the hardware, but if you're running a license that's per core, that can get very expensive as well. So that's going to depend on what database you're using. And if, if finally, it's also inflexible. Because what if I need this Godzilla database during Black Friday or during freshman move-in, but I don't need it the rest of the year? So I'm paying a lot of money for one huge database server that I only really need full capacity, you know, a small part of the year, or maybe once a month or something like that. But maybe that's fine. Maybe that's totally fine. It's, you got the money to burn on hardware. You don't, you don't care about licenses, or you've got money to burn on licenses. That's fine. Or cloud VMs. They're, they're, it's just dropping a bucket compared to your revenue. The server goes down or needs upgraded. That's fine. You can just do it at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night. You know, that's no big deal. I know you guys like doing that. It's fine. <clears throat> But this is where distributed databases can help, if it's not fine, if you don't think it's fine. You can do this with relational databases as well. This is not limited to just uh, Couchbase or document databases. It can be done with relational databases as well. But many NoSQL databases are built with this approach in mind. It's built into the design and the architecture of the software. So if you have a database cluster like this, all these databases act together, all these servers act together as one database as one unit, a, a cluster. And if you need more capacity, you just rack up more servers and add it to your cluster. So now we have eight up there. And I can keep going, I can add more and more of these relatively inexpensive servers to a cluster. So now I don't have to upgrade my hardware, I can just add more hardware to the cluster. Uh, the licensing may or may not cost you less, that, that depends a lot on uh, <coughs> you know, what kind of software you're using and, and your calculus of your organization. So that, that may cost you less. Your capacity is flexible because now I can take those servers down. Uh, you know, if it's a, if a server you already bought, then that's, you're gonna save electricity costs. But if it's a VM, that's gonna save you that much money per day to take that VM down until you actually need it. And uh, there are some other benefits to NoSQL databases. I'm not gonna touch on that too much today. Uh, but if you're interested, I'd love to talk to you about it. Come see me afterwards. So, COUCH. I told you before it was an acronym. It's an acronym. Does anybody know what the acronym means? Well, here, here's the meaning. I'll reveal it to you. So, cluster of unreliable commodity hardware. So, let's go through this just one word at a time here. Cluster, it means that it's distributed computing. It's spread out amongst multiple machines communicating with each other and working together. Unreliable, it doesn't have to be unreliable hardware, let me make that clear, but the assumption is that it might be, that any one of those pieces of hardware could fail, or could get split off the network, or something could go wrong. And commodity means that you don't have to vertically scale, you can just rack up cheap servers or cheap VMs as you need to, and, and tweak your capacity. But let's talk about unreliable a bit here. What happens if somebody trips over the power cable to your database server? Now, hopefully that's not a realistic scenario, but some server rooms, man, I don't know. I don't know. So back to the original slide I had before with the one database server and the three web servers. What if the power cord for that SQL server gets unplugged? Can you still sell items? Can you take orders? Can you process some service? Chances are you probably cannot. 
because you have one single point of failure there with that database. With a distributed database, if one of those machines gets unplugged, the rest of them can compensate. They can work together to still provide uh, some service and keep your app running. So just think about this scenario. It doesn't have to be tripping over a cable, but what happens if one part of your system fails? And I'm talking specifically about databases today, but this could apply to any part of your, of your infrastructure. So when we're talking about distributed databases, we have to talk about the CAP theorem, which is also known as Brewer's theorem. Anybody familiar with the CAP theorem? Have you heard of it? Not very many, okay, all right. So this is a theorem that was put forth by a guy named Eric Brewer, and it's about the behavior of distributed databases. And the theorem states that a distributed database can have these three properties, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. That's the CAP and CAP theorem there. And his theorem says that you can only guarantee two of them at a time. Now that word guarantee is kind of an academic guarantee, so I'm gonna come back to that. But you have to pick two of these, and the other one you cannot guarantee that you're going to have it. So there's different combinations of this CAP theorem and different, uh, th I mean, there's no perfect answer here, right? There's, it's, it's all about trade-offs. So I'm gonna go through the different trade-offs and, and uh, we'll cover this in a little more detail here. So let's talk about if I choose consistency and availability. So this is an AC part of the CAP theorem. This means the system is not partition tolerant. And what I mean by, by partition tolerant is that if the network partitions, if one half of the cluster can't talk to the other half of the cluster, or some of the nodes in the cluster, they go down for whatever reason. If, they, if they're not tolerant of that, then they really aren't a distributed system. So what we've got here is pretty much just your single point of failure type of design, where it's, it's always consistent, it's always available, but if something happens to the network, it just falls apart and doesn't work. All right, so, Generally, these ACs are not considered distributed databases. Availability and partition tolerance. So this is AP. So there's really only two options for distributed. That's AP and CP. Now availability means that when a network partition happens, you can still perform reads and writes to any piece of data. So any piece of data is still available for you to read and modify. So even if that data lived on a server that can no longer be accessed, so if that server goes down, it's uh, partitioned into a different network, you can still interact with that piece of data. So then the question happens is what happens if that node that the data was on, I've made a change to it on node A while node B was down, what happens if node B comes back up? Now there's a potential for conflict now because I have the same uh, key, the same piece of data on two different places in potentially two different states. So you have to resolve this conflict. This is known, also known as siblings, by the way, if you're familiar with uh, React or uh, maybe Cassandra calls it that too. You can resolve this conflict in a number of ways. You can have the database resolve the conflict for you, and it can do this in some simple ways. You can say, well, whichever one was written last, according to timestamp, that's the one that wins. Or you can say, which is the one that was, um, has the most number of revisions? That's the one that wins. And so that's a simple way you can resolve that conflict at the database level. At the, you can also resolve it at the client level. You can do a merge, kind of like a source control merge. Or you can let the user resolve the conflict, which would be kind of like win merge or something like that. No matter what though, you cannot guarantee that a merge will never have to be manually handled. There's always going to be a case where it's a possibility. So if availability is important to you, that you always want to be able to read and write some specific piece of data, then AP is the design you want to go with. But the trade-off there is you have to deal with consistency. So let's look at the other design, consistency and partition tolerance. This is the, P, uh, the CP. Consistency means that even when a network partition happens, 
there's only a single up-to-date copy of the data. So there's never going to be a conflict. If a node goes down, you can no longer access documents on that node. Now, that might sound kind of dire. The trade-off there is that we don't have to do the conflicts anymore. But just for example, with Couchbase, the way Couchbase handles this, Couchbase is a CP type of design, there are replica documents stored on other nodes. So when you save a document onto node A, copies are made to node B, C, and, and potentially even D. And then those copies can be viewed as read-only copies. So even if the primary document goes down, it's no longer accessible, you can still get a read-only view of that document. Okay? And then when a node is, goes down, the other nodes get together and discuss, well, is that node down? Is, and that if, when they agree on that node being down, they can initiate a failover, which says, okay, the documents on that node are no longer valid. They are garbage. They are not up to date anymore. They're gone. And we'll take the replicas and we'll promote them to be the active copy, or a replica to be the active copy. And now you can proceed with your reading and writing of that document. So there is some period of time where it's not available. But if everything's functioning as it should, you get all three of these. So I'm going to get to that point next. But there is a time component to the CAP theorem that I think a lot of people don't really think about. The CAP theorem is sometimes a bit misunderstood. It's not quite as severe as it sounds. Partitions, you have to be prepared for them because you cannot guarantee that the network will always be up and they'll always be talking to each other. But partitions are relatively rare in your data center, it's pretty rare that you know, a node will no longer get network connectivity. Uh, but you can't 100% guarantee it, right? So it's strictly true that you cannot promise all three at the same time. But assuming your cluster is working as it should, and the nodes are all up, then you get all three of them at the same time. But not always. So there's a time component there. So in a real distributed implementation, you have to factor in time as well. And so it's more of a cap spectrum than a severe one or the other. And in addition, just to make it even more complicated, you can tweak data database systems to act more towards one end of the spectrum or the other. So I mentioned the relational databases early on. Traditionally, they'd be in the AC camp by default. But certainly you can configure them to scale out, use sharding, things like that, load balancing. Um, to make them act as either AP or CP. And Couchbase, you can configure multiple clusters to act together as AP. So you can get availability out of Couchbase by just setting it up in a different way. Now typically that's used for geographical distributions or um, like, a, like, a, like a hot hot type of uh, setup there. But you, you could configure it to, to be AP. So that makes it even more complicated. So when someone says, oh, it's an, it's an AP, I don't want to use it because it's never consistent. Well, that's, that's just a really severe oversimple vice versa. OK. So any questions about the CAT theorem? I'm not like a super academic expert on it. But if you have questions now for clarification, it would be a good time for it. OK, cool. So I want to show you the basic architecture of Couchbase. Now this is the official documentation. No, just kidding. This is, this is a sketch I did on my whiteboard. Uh, it's, my, it's sort of my, the picture in my mind of how Couchbase works. So I'm sure I'm leaving out lots of details here. But basically, as a developer, you're going to interact with the Couchbase SDK up there to read and write documents, perform queries, and so on. And that SDK is interacting with something called the Cluster Manager, which lives on, uh, I'm going to say, one of the nodes at a time, but if that node goes down, the cluster manager on, the, on another node takes over. So it sort of, it can jump around, but typically you're interacting with one cluster manager on one node. So the SDK, the cluster manager, they talk to each other and they, they sort of map out your cluster and say, okay, uh, documents uh, A through G, they'll go on node one, and G through Z will go on node two, and so on. But it's done automatically, so you don't have to, spec you don't have to do the sharding yourself. It's automatically sharding. So, I'll save a document. It will, uh, the cluster manager says, OK, that document should go on node 1. Uh, this document should go on node 2. And it does this via a hashing algorithm. 
So it's a relatively even distribution of documents. Now, the cluster manager will take the document that you're writing and put it into the cache in RAM. And then it'll say, okay, I'm done. So you're interacting with the RAM most of the time, which makes this very, very fast. And then the document gets put into a queue to be written to the disk later, and another queue to be written to other nodes as replicas later. And then vice versa, when you're reading, it's pulling it from the cache, not going to the disk to get your documents. Uh, again, that's sort of default behavior. <clears throat> so everything is stored in RAM as much as possible. And there's more to it, but uh, it makes it more complicated. So uh, any, any questions on this architecture here before I get into this craziness over here? OK. Yeah, go ahead. Say that again. <clears throat> um, how fast does a cluster manager move in a failure? Uh, well, I think you'll, well, you'll see today on this contraption here that it's kind of slow, but in a, in a real system, it's, it's not noticeable. So it's, it's pretty, pretty quick. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. So what the heck did I do? A brief history of the couch case. So when I, when I started with Couchbase, I just started less than a year ago. I was really astonished by its ability to recover from these partitions and nodes going down. And I had not really experienced a, a distributed database before. So I, was, I, I just thought this was a cool thing. I want to show it off to people. Uh, I want to talk about it. Um, and so my first thought was that this is the way the engineers in, within Couchbase do it. They'll set up some VMs or Docker images. and um, then they will test what happens if a node goes down by doing this. <laughs> Wasn't that exciting? <laughs> Wasn't that magical? So I could do that, and that's my backup plan, in fact, if this thing goes wrong. <clears throat> but uh, I can tell by your reaction that you're already falling asleep at that. So um, I, was, I was thinking, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. How can I make that more entertaining, more exciting? So, uh, around the time I was thinking about this, I learned of another Couchbase employee who uh, he works with Couchbase Mobile, which is another piece of software we provide. Uh, and he had this nifty hardware set that he would bring to user groups. Um, this is a picture of it here. It's a lot more complex than what I've got here. And, uh, but it's a lot of smaller computers, Raspberry Pis, Intel NUX, uh, a, a Wi-Fi and local network uh, router there. He has a, a load balancer to deal with some of the, um, uh, the data center type stuff he wants to demonstrate. So this seemed really cool to me because you could go in here and unplug one of them and see what happens, right? And that's what he did. And on the screen there you can see you know, some statistics about the cluster and so on. But the idea of carrying this or carrying this around and setting it up at user groups and traveling with it seemed really kind of daunting. I mean, at Codemash here, I had, I was lucky to have a half an hour to set up my camera and my uh, couch case and my laptop. I'm lucky to get that time at other conferences or user groups and tearing down as well. I got to be courteous to the next speaker. Uh, so I wanted something that I could just, you know, wrap up in a briefcase and walk out the room with it if I had to, right? So that got me thinking, what if I got some really tinier, even tinier versions and just simplified it to be just Couchbase server and not all this mobile stuff with him. So I got me thinking and I kept thinking about it and what I wanted was, what I needed, my requirement was a 64-bit processor, quad, <clears throat> quad core, four gig of RAM at the bare minimum. So I did some research looking for tiny computers that fit this, fit the bill. So Raspberry Pi is out because it's not, you know, it's ARM and it has a small amount of RAM. Um, I found these things. These are called Intel Compute Sticks. And they have two gig of RAM. So, but they were the right size and everything else fit the requirements. And I said, okay, and they're only 100 bucks. Let's, 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 let's try this. So I, I came to my boss and I said, boss, this is what I want to do. I want to get some tiny computers. I want to put them in a briefcase. I want to carry them around to user groups. Totally expect him to say, no, Matt, that's silly. What are you doing? 
Go, why did I hire you? Go back to work. But to my complete and utter surprise, he said, sounds cool. Send me a budget. Let's do it. And he's actually here today. So if you see Arun Gupta, uh, th thank him for this nonsense. So, uh, so I ordered one of these sticks. And when, I, when it arrived, you know, it, it's, a, it's a stick that's meant to plug into your TV via HDMI port at the bottom there. And it's a, the idea is to allow you to browse the internet, to uh, watch Netflix, maybe play some casual games, something like that on your TV. And they run either Windows or Ubuntu out of the box. So it's kind of like a souped up Chromecast. Right? Uh, so these aren't exactly ideal devices for running a database on. Uh, the, the Windows version came with two gig. The Ubuntu came with one, so I had to buy the Windows version. So I bought the Windows version, but it came with 32-bit Windows because there's only two gig of RAM. So why do we need 64-bit Windows on it? Uh, so I had to pave over that, and I couldn't install Windows 64-bit because the BIOS is limited. So uh, I had to put Ubuntu on it. Pretty sure that voided the warranty on, on the uh, in a compute stick. And then I had to install a couch-based server on these things which means I had to learn about all kinds of interesting Linux tweaks, which I had no idea existed. So anybody heard of swappiness before? Yes. One person heard of swappiness, two? Two swappiness, three swappiness. Okay, you guys got to explain it to me because I'm not really clear on the concept. <laughs> what about uh, transparent huge pages or THP? Ah, I got you on that one. Okay, I don't know that one either, okay? But I had to figure these settings out and adjust them because and this is true for all database systems, not just Couchbase, but the way that it works, the, the, the Linux default settings, Linux desktop default settings are not ideal for running a, a server that uses the disk in the way that Couchbase does. So I had to adjust those things. Hopefully I did it right. But what I'm getting at is that these are the textbook definition of unreliable. If you look up it in the dictionary, you'll see Intel Compute Stick next to unreliable. So some other things to notice. I had intended to do this over Wi-Fi. You can see that there's wires running everywhere up there. One of them worked fine on Wi-Fi. When I got three of them together in a tiny box, they didn't want to stay connected to my router. I don't know if it's the radios and the Wi-Fi or if I'm doing something wrong or who knows what. I, if you have an idea, come see me afterwards because I want to get this down smaller. So I had to attach a USB dongle to them to connect them to uh, a router there. Otherwise, it would have been a lot smaller, and I could have powered it on a USB hub instead of that big brick there. Um, so I had a smaller case with a, tra a travel Wi-Fi router, and so maybe I'll do a version 2, make it smaller. Maybe next year I'll be here with version 2. I also added these colorful light-up USB cables, which didn't have to do that, but it's, it's cool. Um, they light up when they're powered, and so when you unplug one of them later, you'll see that they, they turn off, so it makes it a little more dramatic. And I also found this really cool case. It already came with foam padding in it. It has a nice little handle on it. It is actually a handgun case that I found. I found that at a sporting goods store. So I've got this handgun case full of uh, wires and electronics. I'm sure you guys are thinking at this point, <laughs> what, what about the TSA? What do they think of this thing? Now, why would you guys think that? I mean, can't a guy travel by himself carry a handgun case full of electronics and wires into an airport, what's the big deal? No, but I'm happy to report that so far the TSA has not given me any trouble for it, but I have not tried to take it in the carry-on yet. So look for me in the news sometime in the future. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Let's go see if we can get this thing to work. All right, so there it is. There's a live shot of the couch case, and you can see it's uh, lit up with red, white, and blue colors. Very patriotic. And if I bring up the, see, see, I told you, unreliable. So 10 and 30 have already crashed, so let me reboot those. 10 and 30 have already crashed, so I'm going to reboot those. But just for a second here, this is the Couchbase console. So this comes with Couchbase when you install it. It's a little uh, web-based administrative tool. And the idea is, one of the things it does is it can show you all the nodes in the cluster. So I'm supposed to have three nodes here. And this is connected by wireless to that router. And those are connected by wired to the router. And I've given them um, fixed IP addresses. 
And then over here is a data, we'll call it data bucket. This is where you put documents in, in Couchbase. This is kind of a logical grouping because it's actually spread out amongst all the nodes, but they're all in one uh, so-called bucket. So these are hopefully going to come back online here. Be nice if we could see all green instead of just pendings. What else can I tell you while I'm stalling for time here? Uh, so I wrote a .NET Core uh, program to kind of demonstrate what's going on here with, um, oh, we've got two of them. We're getting there. What's going on with the cap theorem and some things like that. So let me just make sure I have the bucket is empty. Okay, they're all up. All right. Now I'm going to show you the web-based application. So I'm going to say .NET run. I hope I did that one right. Now let me check the code here real quick. Yep, okay. So I've got the .NET app running on localhost 5000. Anybody use .NET Core yet? One, two, okay. All right, this is, the source code's all available. This is not uh, the canonical way you should use Couchbase. I just wanna make that clear up front. This is a crazy project. Um, but this is just uh, hopefully to show you what's going on here with, these, with the nodes and distributed uh, uh, distributed uh, databases. So if you look here, I'll zoom in a little bit here, this console is showing you how many documents are on each node. So there's zero documents on, there's nothing in the bucket so far, and the other zero is how many replicas there are on that, uh, on that node. So right now it's completely empty. And if I go here and say, give me the document that has key of doc zero, it doesn't exist. So it's going to say I can't find that key and I also can't find the replica for it. All right? So I'll go ahead and I will create 10 documents here. Node go down. I don't see one. I don't see one gone down yet. Okay. Uh, we'll have to refresh. Okay, let's do this again. All right, unreliable, I'm telling you. I practiced this like a dozen times up, up, up to this and still can't get it to work right. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna have to go to, uh, I hate to go to the backup plan. There it is, okay, it came down. So let me just reset this one real quick here. Now I don't have failover turned on right now, so that's why it's not compensating. They're not. Um, working to give me that uh, availability that I want to. So it's just sort of frozen in the consistency side of the, of the spectrum right now. Which I'm going to turn it on later if we can get this thing to work. Okay, still nothing. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to go ahead and empty this bucket out again. Delete from uh, default. Oh. Default. Okay, so I'll reset this. Okay, reset 10. All right, it's not gonna work. Oh, it says temporary failure. Why is that? Nope, key not found. Okay, well, if you guys don't mind, I think I'll go with the, uh, the Docker-based backup. I'm sorry to disappoint you here. But here is, uh, so I've got, let me open another PowerShell up here. I'll still let you come up here and uh, unplug it if you want to, just for fun. Let's see, easy approach. Uh, couch case, okay. Nope, I don't need to do that. I can just do it here. So, okay, I've got, uh, I don't know if you can see this very well, but I've got three Docker images running there. Uh, they're called DB1, DB2, and DB3. So it's three nodes working together, and I have my website running also in a Docker container. Uh, so they're all working together there. And so if I bring up, instead of that one, I'll bring up localhost. So this is the console for the Docker cluster. And I've got three nodes running there, no documents in them. So I'll go here and I'll reset, and now I am, I just added 10 documents to the to the cluster. UI will refresh here in a second, but there you can see 
So three documents were stored on the first node, three on the second one, and four on the third one. So it's kind of evenly distributed them amongst the nodes. And then you can see seven, seven, and six. Those are the replicas of the documents. I'm storing two replicas of each document. So there's a total of 10 documents and 20 replicas. Okay. And let me make sure I have auto failover off. Okay. So if I go over here, I can, uh, okay, the next thing I want to do is I would normally call up a uh, volunteer to unplug one of these devices. So uh, we can still do that if you're interested in seeing it. Anyone want to come up here and mess with my uh, wiring? No one? No. Too afraid? Oh my goodness. Okay. You, you can type the Docker command. You can do that too. Okay. So I would ask you to unplug red, white, or blue from right there. Anyone you want. Okay. All right. There you go. It's unplugged. Okay. Now if you want to type the Docker command, um, so you want to say Docker stop, and you can type in DB1, DB2, or DB3. It's up to you. DB1, DB2, or DB3. Yep. I usually use a little hash code for that. DB1. DB1, enter. Yep. Okay. So he has stopped my uh, node, um, which actually, so that shoots, shuts down my UI as well because that's the only one I have port forwarded to uh, outside the Docker host, but that's fine. Um, so if I refresh here, the, the website, so it's taking its time right now to switch over that cluster manager. And, and remap the, the nodes, like I was saying, but it's, it's still kind of slow because these Docker containers are like one, one gig of RAM or something. So it's going to take a second here. But what we should expect to see is some of these documents will not be available because Couchbase is trying to maintain consistency. So the node that this guy shut down has documents on it that are no longer accessible. It's taking a long time. Am I on the right? Okay, yeah. Operation timeout, that's not right. Okay. It should say key not found, not operation timeout. But you can see that the, the node that he unplugged had doc 2, 7, and 8, and they're no longer accessible. But the replicas for doc 2, 7, and 8 are accessible. They are, however, read-only copies of those documents. So I cannot make changes to them. And in fact, if I go in, this, this, if I click update all 10, it's going to try to add a timestamp to all 10 documents. And if I do that, it's going to give me an error message that it could not update doc2, doc7, and doc8. It's going awfully slow. Is this the right one? 8880? Yeah, I think it's the right one. It's unordinately slow. What's going on here? Well, they're all up and running. Okay, there we go. It took a while, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure why it took so long, but there we go. We can, the, it updated all the documents that it could, and it got errors with doc 2, 7, and 8. So in this period of transition, when one node fails and you haven't recovered from it yet, those documents are unable to be written to because we're going with consistency. Now, if we're going with availability, you could make changes to those documents, but now you have the potential to have siblings, and you have to resolve those conflicts. So. Let me bring that one back up here, docker start db1. Okay, I'll take a second to spin up there. So is it, uh, is it back up yet? Taking its time. There we go. Say that again? Does it cache the request when it's offline? Uh, so I think you can do that. Uh, this app does not, um, as far as I know. Okay, so now the node is back online. So all the nodes are back up. So if I refresh this page, you can see that now I have access to all those documents again, but notice that there's no changes made to doc 2, 7, or 8, because those are remaining consistent. All right? Okay, so I'm going to reset all 10 of those. How are we doing on time? I, I've really been paying attention. Okay. All right, so I'm resetting those. So now I'm going to go into 
settings here in Couchbase, and I'm going to go to this auto failover, and I can turn on a feature that Couchbase calls auto failover. I'm sure it's something similar in other databases. And when I turn this on, that means when a node goes down, the other nodes will see this and eventually agree that the node is down and say, okay, promote those replicas that we have to active so that the user can keep making reads and writes. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn failover on. And if I get one more volunteer up here who wants to type in a Docker command. Anybody? Or just shout out a number, perhaps? Two. Two. Okay, Docker stop two. So I'm going to stop that node. You can see that the node went down almost immediately. Now, the failover process takes at least 30 seconds right now. We're working on a feature in future releases to do a faster failover, but we're never going to get it down to instantaneous because of the cap theorem. So there's going to be some period of time where that happens. So it's going to, to right now, it's, it knows that it's down, but it's trying to make sure that, it's, that everybody agrees that it's down and to initiate the auto failover. So I'm kind of stalling for time here. Oh, you're, okay. So what response you get is the same thing we got before. The, the documents would be unavailable or key not found during that process. Okay, so the uh, failover just happened. If I go back to this web page and refresh, again, it might take a second here to load up. Why is it saying none? Okay, there we go. So now notice that all 10 documents are available, even though one of the nodes is down. And I can update all 10 of these documents make changes to them, read and writes. So we're now available again, and we're still consistent, even though one of our nodes is down. So now the question is, what happens if I bring this node back online? Because that node has now all, all these documents are old. They're out of date. They're no longer consistent. So uh, one thing I could do is I could click this rebalance button and basically say that node is down for good. Just forget about it, just don't even worry about it coming back online. Or I could maybe plug it back in or fix it or whatever and I could start that node back up with docker start, db2. So I say that again? Uh, so the rebalancing is not just the documents, it's the underlying um, uh, constructs that make up a bucket. So a bucket is a logical unit. It's a collection of what's called V buckets. And those V buckets are distributed amongst the nodes. Okay, so that node came back up and you can see that Couchbase says, hey, the server is now reachable. Do you want to add it back to the cluster? In the next rebalance, okay? And my options are I can do a delta recovery or a full recovery. You can probably guess what those mean. The delta recovery will say, if the document's revision matches the revision that we're already using, then we can assume no changes have been made to it and just keep that one. Otherwise, if it's an old revision, just ditch it and uh, we'll, we'll use the active copy on another database. So a delta recovery could be faster. And the full recovery just does the whole thing. Uh, in, in this case, in this demo, it's going to be the same both ways because I updated every single document. But in reality, you probably want to stick to a delta recovery unless you have a good reason to. So I'll go ahead and delta recover. So now, until I click rebalance, we're still available. All 10 documents are still available for us to read and write to. And I click rebalance. It's going to start the process of bringing that node back into the cluster. But it's a background process. In the meantime, I can still interact with and read and write these documents that are on the, the two nodes that are working. So until that process is complete, I still have access to all the documents that I'm working with. So I could just do, I could update all 10 of them if I wanted to. I could touch individual ones. Uh, what have you. So it's taking place in the background. So it's not going to affect your users, your downtime, or anything like that. It's going to take some time to rebalance, though, because, again, it's not necessarily just about the documents, but about the underlying structures behind the scenes. So it's, it's, uh, it's taking its time to, to do that. We should see a progress bar at some point. But again, as a developer, as a user, as a customer, this is an invisible process to you. It's not going to affect your experience. So there, there's the progress bars for the rebalancing. Those are going to um, really 
turn my fan on on the Mac here. <laughs> Um, but uh, you guys can't hear it, but it's working hard because um, I'm basically running like five operating systems at one time. But anyway, so that's what's going on. And once that's done, it'll again be invisible to the user. You'll be able to access those documents. And you can, this is not just when a node fails and you bring it back, but when you want to add capacity, add a node to it, the rebalance happens in the background. And then when it's done, you get that more extra capacity there. Okay, so we don't have to watch it unless you really want to, but uh, that's what it's doing. And that is all I wanted to show you. I was hoping to show you with the couch case here, all this work. But I'll be here the rest of today and tomorrow. If you guys want to play with this, I'm happy to let you tinker with it or give me suggestions. Sure, over there. So the question was, since there's no load balancers, what does the URI look like in your app? So I can show you. This is what it is for the couch case right here. I've given it all three URLs for the nodes. Now, I don't have to give it all three because that cluster manager, like I said, lives on all three nodes. So I could give it one node and then the cluster manager would say, oh yeah, and here's some other nodes that I found too. And the SDK can then know where those nodes are. So you want to put as many URLs in here as you can, but you don't have to. So that's up to you how you want to manage that, you know, the list of all the nodes in there. Probably you want to put it in code like I did, because now you have to recompile, put in a config file that you can just deploy without having to rebuild your app. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's all the source codes on GitHub. So okay. So the rebalance is done. Any more questions before I go back over to the slides? All right, cool. All right, so one more thing I wanted to talk about with databases like Couchbase is that they have some benefits other than just scaling and performance. Um, and, and one of those features I really like is the ability to have a flexible schema in your data. So uh, Couchbase documents are JSON objects or maybe JSON arrays. So you don't have to, there's, there's no schema enforced by Couchbase. So I can, whatever I send to it in the form of a JSON object, it's going to store. And I can retrieve that and then serialize it to a C-sharp class or, or whatever I need to. Uh, so there's some flexibility there. So I've just on the screen here, here's this, uh, an idea of some of the flexibility you have. On the left side, I have a company document and it has references to invoices based on a key. It's an array of keys that link to other invoices. So you can get the company and then you can say, okay, give me invoice one, give me invoice two, et cetera. Uh, alternatively, you can just denormalize. Uh, on the left side, or on the, did I say the right side the first time or left side? On this side, you can denormalize. So the invoices are stored with the company in the document. So they're all stored as one document. So you don't have to do a join or you don't have to do multiple fetches. You can just say, give me the document. So there are some flexible options there. This is something of a, du a dual-edged sword. Some people are uncomfortable with this because there's no uh, referential constraints in there. So it's kind of a different way of thinking about storing your data. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on that because that's not the focus of this session. but. If you're interested in learning more, I'd be glad to talk to you about uh, JSON and document databases and, and Couchcase. Here is the source code for that crazy demo I showed you. Again, I want to stress, this is not the ideal way to use the Couchbase.NET SDK. Um, but if you want to play with this, I've got instructions there for you. You don't have to build your own Couchcase. You can use Docker. All the instructions are out there to show you how to do it. Um, it's just a fun little exercise in distributed computing. It makes it a little more visual and, and tangible, I think. I've got some cool stickers up here for you. If you guys are interested, come talk to me afterwards. You can, I got business cards up here too, uh, with my contact info on them. If you want to learn more about us at Couchbase, um, blog.couchbase.com. This is my family, actual size. And, uh, and, uh, you know, if you're on Twitter, let me know. I want to follow you on Twitter. I'm M. Groves there. And we also have our Dev Advocate team has a, a Twitter account there. So I've got time for questions, I think. 
Yeah, anything you guys want to ask me at all about Couchbase or, or scaling or anything, I'd be happy to talk about it. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, so how does Couchbase like, differ from Mongo? How does Couchbase differ from Mongo? So this is a pretty broad question, I would say. Um, I'm glad to talk with you afterwards. One of the things that I think Couchbase makes Couchbase stand out is, um, is the auto sharding spilled into it. Uh, you don't have to configure any special sharding or anything like that. Uh, Couchbase has uh, the nickel query language, which is a SQL-like, actually a SQL superset that you can use to query JSON documents. So you can do things like joins and inserts, updates, deletes, all that cool stuff with a document database. So the term NoSQL database doesn't really apply anymore, I think. Um, that's just a couple of minor things. We can talk more afterwards, sure, yeah. But they're definitely in the same space. They're both document databases, yeah. Yeah. How long did it take me to build this briefcase? So, oh, geez. Well, I went through several iterations because I was so frustrated with that Wi-Fi thing. Uh, I mean, probably a month-ish of tinkering with it. Um, I think it can be better, get a more reliable PC that's meant for that sort of thing. Yeah, version two. Look for it next year. <laughs> sure. And if, again, if you guys have suggestions to improve this, I want to hear them because this thing has been frustrating to me. It's been a windmill I've been tilting at for a while, so. Yeah, all the way back, Priya. So, um, you said that the read on this uh, keep playing in the background? Yeah. So, is there going to be a period where it's not spinner, is there a chance that we would not have run the relative to the and system and find that it's not Right. So, so the question is, during, during the rebalance, is there a possibility of there being inconsistency? Um, so the rebalance happens in the background, but you can still interact with those documents while that process is happening. And when the rebalance is done, um, it just sort of switches over, and, the, and there's no period in there where you can make changes and get them in an inconsistent state that, I, that I'm aware of. Now, somebody may get really clever and come up with something to break that, but that's the way it's designed, is, is not to allow it's to be consistent. It's that CP in the cap theorem. Okay. Well, any more questions? I'll be here, but thank you very much, guys. Enjoy CodeMash. <laughs>